The Waitangi Tribunal was established, I think, in the 19, late 1980s, early 1990s by uh, Geoffrey Palmer, then, then Labor government. The Waitangi Tribunal was charged with investigating and making recommendations only to the government about the resolutions of issues arising from the Treaty of Waitangi. It was a um, set up with the powers, I think, of a Commission of Inquiry or a Royal Commission of Inquiry to help this country move forward in terms of race relations and resolution of outstanding issues. Um, Boy, has it covered a lot of ground in the intervening years and could it be that it is now, well, getting a little too big for its boots, though I do not know the Māori translation of those words. Um, At the moment, against the wishes, I would say, of the government of the day, the Waitangi Tribunal is count and doing some sort of investigation into a number of things, including Oranga Tamariki, uh, social welfare, the outfit that's meant to take care of our kids, of kids like um, Baby Ruthless Empire. And in what may be an unprecedented move, the tribunal has essentially subpoenaed, or says it will subpoena, a sitting MP and Minister, Karen Chua, of the New Zealand First Party which has in itself uh, prompted quite some uh, response from Minister of the Crown and New Zealand First Deputy Leader, uh, Party Deputy Leader Shane Jones, who joins us uh, by phone uh, now. Uh, Shane, welcome uh, back to the platform. Before we go any further, um, there are legal matters involved here and I want to be as clear as possible as I can with our audience as to how that might restrict the conversation we can have this morning. Yeah, morning, folks. The Waitangi Tribunal, you're quite right, was created some time ago, nigh on 50 years ago in 1975. And it was designed to um, provide a platform to deal with historical uh, wrongdoing over the loss of land and other rights. And in 1985... Uh, Geoffrey Palmer, the then Deputy Prime Minister, uh, and the Labour government changed its writ and it was enabled to investigate claims uh, well back before 1975, Mm. back to the signing of the treaty. And then, um, obviously, it dealt with some monstrous claims. The the issues that uh, you and I can talk about and uh, sorry, look, I just want to correct, of course, Karen Chura is from ACT, not from uh, from New Zealand First. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so, so the issues around that particular uh, event now have gone, uh, to the best of my knowledge, to the High Court. And one of the one of the interesting things about being uh, a member of Parliament and a Minister of the Crown is that the Cabinet minute, a uh, Cabinet minute, the Cabinet manual requires that uh, we respect a thing called comity, not comedy, comity. And basically, the different organs of the state have to respect each other. So because there's a high court case, then we park that over there, and cabinet ministers are not to embroil themselves in that. But look, uh, well, well, Shane, let's put that in layman's persons. You've been told now that the game's afoot, you've got to watch your mouth. Uh, well, probably I'm being told to watch my mouth every time I open it. Uh, But I have been talking about some very uh, controversial matters, not the least of which, and I know you don't want to talk about it, uh, mining and stuff. Oh, no, don't mind talking about that. Oh, well, um, what's made me incredibly unpopular um, over the last sort of 72 hours is that David Parker, um, who's a dear friend of mine, and Labor actually uh, did a, a furtive thing and changed the law so that coal mining would close down in New Zealand by 2030. Mm. They never campaigned on that, so we've now changed the law, well, it'll be changed shortly, that if you are a coal miner, then whatever licenses, whatever permits you want, um, they're the same as anyone else. I I, I just uh, felt that there's enough people earning their living. New Zealand has clean coal. It's highly sought after around the world. But because I've put my hand up and put my head up, I'm being severely yeah, yeah, okay. bloody look, bashed. Look, I want to come back to the right Waitangi. Anyway, let's move yeah, back to yeah. let's come back to the Waitangi about. treatment. So there is a case currently before the High Court which concerns what? Whether or not Karen uh, well, Chua can be compelled to appear before the committee? Uh, yeah, but um, if, I can, if, I, if I can deal with it like this, 
the test is New Zealand First brought forward a set of ambitions to do with treaty things in general. Those ambitions were mandated by our democratic um, experience through the election. The Waitangi Tribunal, uh, amongst other things, is hearing claims that our coalition agreement commitments are a violation of the treaty. Now, they're entitled to do that. Um, and it's an interesting contest. Okay, whose who, writ is of more importance? We went out and campaigned. Our leader, Winston Peters, has for a long period of time uh, embedded into the party's DNA that um, the whole treaty industry has drifted away from the mm. uh, well-being of the ordinary Māori. So we're now in the situation where the Waitangi Tribunal is uh, investigating claims that are essentially an allegation that somehow we're breaking the treaty on the basis of the democratic promises we made to the public. And then our response has been, OK, we're going to review the purpose and the writ of the Treaty of Waitangi Tribunal. That doesn't lie with me. That lies with other ministers. But whilst we're doing that, we've got these live cases happening right. virtually every week, every month. Has a minister ever been effectively subpoenaed by the Waitangi Tribunal before? I've I've never heard of um, I've I've never heard of such a thing um, happening before. Um, the I don't I don't know if the select committee can subpoena a minister. I'm not sure. Yeah. But I mean, well, that, well, well the argument issue. I see being put forward is that they have the powers of a royal commission of inquiry, and they can. Uh, it would be most uh, I've never heard of it before, and it would seem strange. Would you argue also putting aside the specifics of the matters currently before the court, minister? That the Waitangi Tribunal has been politicised and has become a political organisation rather than a statutory one. Well, it's no longer the august body it was in the days of um, Eddie Jury, a former High Court judge. And when you have the tribunal delving into the constitutional makeup of New Zealand, really constitutions are essentially a matter of political power. If you want to change the constitution, go and win the hearts and minds. I mean, part of the reason why the law has changed over the future of Māori seats at local government is that Manaya Mahuta and Jacinda never campaigned on it, never told Winston and I they were going to do that before 2020. And then in 2021, while no one else was looking, they changed the law and uh, denied communities the ability to go through a referendum prior to the creation of the Māori seats. That's a constitutional thing. That lies with the hearts and minds and the ebb and flow of political will. And sadly, the Waitangi Tribunal is now um, delving very deeply into uh, the makeup of our constitution. Mm. And I, I, I put it to you that it's not the role of the Waitangi Tribunal to rewrite our constitution. It's the right of voters and the legislators that they send to Parliament. Now, I wouldn't uh, disagree I with you, uh, Minister, but I would also add that a certain amount of the rhetoric of recent years has probably created the impression amongst some, uh, particularly the more radical uh, Māori and, and sort of Tinakoko Pakia rad Māori radicals, that the Waitangi Tribunal is in some ways a separate government or part of the two-government system that the Waitangi Tribunal, they wrongly think, uh, the Waitangi Treaty, they wrongly think, created in New Zealand. I'd say the tribunal has take on, taken on some mythical status as part of the constitutional framework of New Zealand. Look, the Waitangi Tribunal's got no business supporting the uh, concept of native sovereignty. It's got no business breathing life into the Declaration of Independence um, that was signed between a small number of Māori leaders and um, and I think uh, the British resident, James Busby, in 1835. Uh, what is, and I've seen it up in the Ngāpuhi claim, an area that is uh, screaming out 